please, if you have questions, ask questions. And uh, I'll turn it over to Clint. Thank you. Uh, I hate when Chris does that because then I feel like i got to live up to it, you know, uh, uh, when he says that. Uh, as, a, as a little bit of a background, I farm in God's country. Do you all know where that is? It's, uh, it's, on, it's in Scott County, Kentucky. It's far away from here. Uh, it, will, it won't quit raining there versus I know you guys down here have been pretty dry, uh, especially a little south of here. I wish you could drag some of this rain down there. I still, have a, I still have 600 acres to plant in central Kentucky. It is just bone, opposite of bone dry. It is wet, wet, wet uh, up there. Uh, I quit farming because, or I quit raising cattle and went to all row crop because of the poor fence. He's making me wear this. I don't think I need. Can y'all still hear me? If I have them down here. Well, that will change significantly what I have to say. Uh, so, don't worry. All right. Uh, all right. Well, thanks a lot. All right. So first thing before we get into the the laws that are actually printed out, uh, you all have every bit of the fencing law. Outside of judge made law, inside of your all's packet, there's a tab uh, towards the front of your book there. I think it's two or three tabs in there. Uh, and so I'm going to make several references to the fence law, but if you all want to keep that, I'm sure as a, as a material guide uh, from that point forward, you'll be able to go back and reference this, particularly if you have a fun talk with a neighbor. All right, before I start the talk, has anybody in here never played this game? I'm holding this up, and you're like, I have no idea what that is. I've never played it. So everybody else has, right? How's the game end? You win. <laughs> Very good. I like that spirit. I'm the same way. Anybody else ha have siblings and know how this game ends? The board gets flipped over, right? What else? Bloodshed. One of the two, or somebody goes and complains to mom because the other one's cheating or something like that. All right, so when you're playing, what goes in the middle? Money. Who says no? Who doesn't know now that I asked that question? But you thought it was money, but you don't want to raise your hand now. Taxes, but the, the, the chance money and any forfeitures and stuff like that, most people play where the money goes in the middle of the board. What do the instructions of the game say? What? No, the, the instructions say nothing goes in the middle of the board. Now, how many people didn't know that? But they've been playing that the money goes in the middle their whole life, right? Well, who told you the instruct who told you the rules of the game when you started playing? Somebody else that didn't read the rules of the game. So there is nothing else that I have found that is more analogous to agriculture law in Kentucky than that. <laughs> Well, I know the rule. Okay, who told you the rule? Somebody that didn't read it. <laughs> Great. Where did you find that out? Well, I go to a store. It's primarily known for selling gasoline, but I eat lunch there pretty much every day. And there's a table that I don't care what the question is, they know the answer. They will know your Monopoly answer. Yesterday I was in there, and I knew the answer to my closed center hydraulics versus open center hydraulics question. They knew that. Tomorrow if I have a problem with my hip, they will tell me how to perform surgery on somebody. Same guy. Uh, they know everything. So today, we're going to, at least in terms of uh, the fence law in Kentucky, we're going to abandon the knowledge table uh, wherever we're eating or the monopoly board and we're actually going to go and we're going to look at the examples that are given uh, in the law and the guidance that's provided there. Uh, Chris and Jeremy and some of the Gallagher guys have heard me uh, do this speech enough that I've been trying to wrap it uh, or mix it up a little for my own benefit uh, as much as anything else. Uh, so I'm going to approach this a little bit differently than I have normally. All right, so you're cruising down the road and you whack a deer. Just jumps right out in front of you, suicidal deer. Things have been going wrong in that deer's life. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it was looking at tariff payments and import stuff, uh, and it, it just it decided to meet its end with your car. So you hit the deer, right? Now, what if, let, let's pause that for a second. Now, the, before that, the deer was standing on the side of the road, and it was a nice one, and you had a rifle. 
If you shoot that deer while it's on the side of the road, who owns that deer? Outside of hunting season in Kentucky, who owns the deer? The state of Kentucky. Now, if you hit one of those deers on the road, do you get to send the state of Kentucky a bill for your vehicle damage? No, probably not. So it's a law about who owns the thing when you hit it. But when you hit wildlife while you're cruising down the road, there is no recovery available to the person uh, in the vehicle, and it's impossible to, to peg ownership of the deer to any particular person. Even though it's living on your farm, and maybe that's its residence or domicile, that's not your deer ever, is it? So you're not responsible. Now... We have a storm, or we have the slightest dusting of snow, or we have some cattle that just decide to break out somehow. Now the cow's out there. You hit the ve your vehicle hits a cow, causes tremendous vehicle damage, maybe even loss of life, depending on how you were driving. Car hit, ends up in the ditch. Now who's responsible? The cow was? Oh, you almost hit one this morning. Oh, good. We're going to come back to you. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> but if you hit the cow, who's responsible? The owner. Now, at the KDA, I get a lot of weird questions. The weird one that I got last week is, is it legal for me to frog gig in a cemetery? <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I am researching that because that's, that's a very specific question. Now, I, we get a lot of questions uh, at the KDA about if there's uh, cattle that are found roaming and there's no identification, there's actually some laws about take her up, and I, I make that uh, uh, bovine my own and I, with the intent of going and selling it, right? It's amazing how people won't claim a cow if it has been involved in an accident out on the road. <laughs> but... but Chances are they're going to find you, and as the owner, you're responsible for those damages. And the theory in the law is that uh, your property is an extension of you. So when your property causes damage to somebody else, you're responsible. Same as if you're out there mowing along the front, and your, your bush hog hits something and sends it out into the road and hits a car, well, you're still responsible. Same as if the cow uh, is out there, uh, even though it's its own living, breathing, thinking thing, you're still responsible. Uh, it's, it's a legal theory under the law that's been, been around since before this country was founded. So, when you're out there, how much is a cow damage going to be to a car? <coughs> Ten grand? They're all made of plastic now. You can't, you can't straighten plastic. Uh, so you're going to do that. What if you've cause somebody to crane into the ditch or hit a school bus or something like that. Pretty bad, right? So you're responsible. So say that's $10,000. Let's go cheap uh, on that. Can you all write a check right now for ten grand? Just right now. Make that person go away. All right, so in your, in your packet, let's flip over, and this is a couple statutes in, to 256-080. So it's your calf or your cow that's out there steer, bull, whatever. The first time that that thing escapes, the first time that you have a known escape and it gets out there, you're responsible for the damages. And let's just say it's $10,000 right now. About the middle of that paragraph, read, trespass of the cattle by the same owner. Now this is the second time they get out. Upon the second occurrence, or every occurrence thereafter, the damages are doubled. So even though you cause $10,000 worth of damage to somebody, you're going to be writing a $20,000 check from then on. So as an attorney, and I'm taking off my farmer hat, and I'm just saying it's a strict liability analytical point, this is your motivation for making sure that you have proper legal perimeter fence in the Commonwealth. It's to keep those things on your property where the only thing that they'll damage is what? Your stuff, not exposure and damages to others. So that is the whole reason that we have the laws in the eastern part of the United States that we do. We are a fence in state. Almost everything or everything um, east of the Mississippi says if you have cattle you, and you want 
to have cattle, you're required to keep them within the bounds of your property, whether that's owned property or rentals. We'll get on into this in a minute about landowners' responsibilities versus tenants' responsibilities because there's some differences on those. But if you have cattle, you are required to keep these things in your property. Yes, sir. Oh, that's good. There we go. That's That'll be a good place to start. Flip back a couple pages. A lawful fence in Kentucky is a strong fence. If you got a weak fence, that's not going to count. But it is a strong fence and sound. Ready? You reading in part A? Four feet tall. Four feet tall. Sufficient enough, and go a couple uh, lines down there in part B, that cattle cannot escape or, are you ready for it, creep through. How many people in here have watched cattle escape a paddock? Would you describe that as the cattle creeping through that fence? Boy, what's that usually like? Very dramatic. You've usually got your hands up, you're screaming at them, you're inventing cuss words. They didn't stop them, did it? No, you just stop walking and they're going to keep on going whichever direction that they're pointed. So you have to have a fence sufficient to deal with that. Now, as a judge, because we're, we're talking about lawsuits here, prevention of lawsuits to begin with and then winning a lawsuit if we ever have one, if you're a judge and you've got literally a thousand cases have been assigned to you and you're trying to whittle out and get rid of cases as quickly as possible and you want to come up for a, a reasoning or a new decision about what a good fence would be versus a bad fence, in layman's terms, what's a good fence? Nah. That's, that's, I, I don't want, if I'm a judge and I'm wearing black robes and I'm going to come out there and check your fence and like wiggle on the wires and wiggle on the post, I don't need to know any of that. If I'm a judge, what will be my decision point? What's the purpose of a fence? Yep, keep animals in or out. What would a bad fence be? A fence that doesn't keep the animals in or out. And it's probably a good fence if it keeps the animals in. How many people drove here today, just driving down the road, and you, you look at other people's fence and cattle, right? The last three times that I've rear-ended another vehicle, it was because I was looking at other people's crops, <laughs> corn in particular. But y'all do it too with cattle, right? So you're driving in today, and you look over at somebody else's front fence or their paddocks, and you think, oh my God. Those cattle are only on that farm because those cattle want to be on that farm. For those of you not laughing, they're laughing at your fence. <laughs> That's just how it is. So it's a results-driven uh, decision on that. The result of, did the fence serve its purpose or not? So you can abandon the four feet tall. Look at when this thing was made. Scroll down. It was amended last in 1944. I mean, people have been to UK, been in the Garrigus building or Western or anywhere else and have seen the old vintage photographs of cattle from the 40s and 50s. How tall were these things? Well, they're about that tall. Before we bred for height and calving ease and some of the other traits that have required larger framed uh, animals, those things were real kind of like a drum with legs on them. A four-foot tall fence back then might have done the job. So today, it just simply does not. Now you need a fence sufficient to keep whatever you're doing inside of wherever you are. But it was last amended in 1944, meaning that during wartime, the people that were left here revised the fence laws. So you've got some antiquated language here that probably doesn't reflect modern farming. But there's some decisions out there that say a good fence is one that has kept them in, a bad fence is not. What's the difference then if you've got fence that I would describe as marginal fence, but it's doing its job, what's the difference between the good fence and the bad fence then? Time or a motivated animal, right? I mean, people in here have some, bought some steers and you think, I'm not running those in the front until they've chilled out here for about 30 days in the middle. Right until they get the the run of the th run of the farm, they don't think that I'm trying to kill them or my dog is. 
I'm going to keep them somewhere else, and then a as they become calmer, we'll maybe rotate them around. But at any given time, you have Mother Nature that could destroy a fence. You have uh, just simple wear and tear on the fence itself, mechanical <laughs> failures, uh, fence posts that rot uh, eventually. That's usually aided by something else. Or number three, you have an animal that is testing the limits of your fence, and that's all that stands between you and potential liability if they escape your farm uh, when they do that. Your question was, in Kentucky, what's a lawful fence? There's your definition, the, def the statutory answer, and the real legal answer, but that's where we start. So once you determine that you need a fence, the law in Kentucky is perimeter fence only, meaning the boundary line between you and your neighbor requires a fence. That's what Kentucky's fence law is all about. Kentucky fence law does not care about your internal fence, the internal uh, paddocks that you've made up, how you've carved the farm up, none of that. Kentucky law only cares about the perimeter of your property, kind of the wall that keeps your cattle in. That is all that matters. Perimeter fence means just that. Perimeter fence means my fence is on the line of the property. How many people in here are very sure that their fence is on the line? And by being sure, I mean you've got your deed out or somebody did a survey and guaranteed that that fence was on the line. How many other people think, now I bought the farm and that's where they told me the line was? Or I inherited the farm and that's been the fence line as far as I can remember back ages. Right? How many people in here are absolutely sure their fence is on the right line? One. <coughs> Out of how many people? Forty? Absolutely. The, my historic family farm starts at a large flat rock at, at Kentucky River and you go up the hill to a large sycamore tree. That was written 200 and something years ago. Now, I'm guessing the tree's not there. I don't know if the rock is still there or not, but these deeds are terrible. So you have deeds that make fence line creation almost impossible as well as pins and calls that have made that tougher. How many people in here have a fence line and another fence line? Well, Granddad had this fence line, but I wasn't going to push all that out. I wasn't going to do all that. So my new fence line is about 10 foot over. Now, it's genetics in my family that I'm not going to mow and maintain a fence line, but I'm going to now. Y'all have any fences like that on your property? Granddad and Dad never maintained that fence, and it all got grown up. It's too expensive to rent the machine to go through and clear all that out. So instead, I'm going to make a new fence about 15 feet away from the old one. But I'm going to mow it. Right? Do you all ever mow it? Does that ever happen? It does. Well, that's only because there have been successful new genetics into your family tree that is allowed for fence mowing, because historically it just wasn't there. Uh, but have you all seen fences like that, though? They're exceedingly common. How do you know that your fence line, your, your perimeter fence, wasn't done like that on purpose? Or how do you know that once the fencer started out, prior to your taking ownership, that he wasn't 5, 10, 15 feet off? I have dealt with dozens, probably a hundred, hundreds of cases at this point, where a fence line dispute very quickly becomes a boundary line dispute with your neighbor. So chances are, if you're in this class and you're talking about fence, you already have at least one neighbor that's probably not real keen on building fence. You're going to make them angry when you talk about this stuff with them, and we'll talk about some tactics to avoid that. But then number two, are you very sure that you and your neighbor agree on where the fence is if it came down to a legal battle? I don't know. I own a couple places now. I don't know for sure where my fence lines, I know where my fence lines are because I can see them, but I'm not sure exactly where my property line is because they were done without pins and calls surveys. So just be aware that the, the fence needs to go on the line. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Okay. Mm hmm. Maybe. That's my legal response to almost everything. They, you go to law school for three years to say maybe when people ask you questions. Uh, his question is, in Kentucky, if I'm a rural property owner and I may not have, I might not have a perimeter fence. Maybe one doesn't exist or maybe it's very poor, but maybe I'm not running cattle in those paddocks. Am I responsible for building fence? The question or the answer to that is absolutely. Let's scroll on down. 030 state that uh, adjoining landowners must maintain a fence. Well, Clint, what if there's not a fence there? Then you got to build one. If one of the two parties needs it and they're involved in agriculture, as a rural landowner, you have an obligation to build and maintain fence. That is powerful. So you have a, you have a, you're buying a farm. It's got a five acre lot that had been carved off on it at the front, so to speak, out next to the road. That person's probably not going to run cattle on their five acre lot, are they? A lot of folks that buy these lots out in the county are shocked to learn that they are responsible for fence if the other party wants to enforce rights to build fence. Now, if you have two landowners, neither one of which are engaged in livestock agriculture, and neither one of them want a fence, then no fence is required. There's not a, there's not a default that says you must build fence. But if either one of the two parties, and one of them has to be involved in agriculture, want a fence, it must be built. Whoa, we're going to keep our herd on our land, and in order to do that, we're going to have to build fence, because if the cattle move off of you and onto somebody else's property and it causes damage, you're, you're liable. So anybody in here, the default, and I'm telling you statutory things, because I'm telling you what you can look up right here, right now. The point is, if you're running cattle, ultimately, they're an extension of you. You've got to keep them on your property. But if I'm the landowner that doesn't have cattle, do I still have to build and maintain a fence with somebody that does? And the answer is yes. So it's pretty powerful. So no, don't be grazing on anybody else's property uh, because you could be found liable for the damages on that. But if you're a rural landowner and you're up against somebody with livestock, yes, you are required to pay for the fence. Yes, sir, there was a question in the back. I think Mr. Jackson, yeah, ma'am, yeah, struggling? Okay, all right, so, so we've got that. So you've got adjoining landowners must maintain the fence. We've talked about escape and insurance. So that's very easy, yes, sir. Well, if there's no fence there initially, yes, they do. They need to make, they, they participate in their part of the fence. And the guidance for that's found in 042. Usually I get a lot more questions about this. People are miffed. Yeah, I'm good. I just don't, I can't think of any situation where I would have to build a fence because I Where they've accepted it or where they've. Yes, ma'am. I, I agree with that as well. In Kentucky, we do have a system where one producer hypothetically can externalize some of those costs out to a neighbor. And that is a major problem with our law. Well, you can. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about why it's a terrible idea. Well, th this law will probably be challenged in my lifetime. We there's just not been a, a really good uh, legal dispute on it yet to get to a court to where the Supreme Court in Kentucky can weigh in. Right, so if, if we're going to build fence, so we're, we're going to go out later today, uh, we're going to learn some techniques on building fence and bracing posts and all of that. If you all ever need help, Chris, Jeremy, anybody with a Gallagher shirt on, 
will come back out and help you for free forever uh, to maintain and uh, uh, build the fence, free repair parts. It's great. They, it's not advertised or in writing anywhere, but trust me, they'll do it. Uh, so so uh, uh, in that, when you do buy a bundle of posts or you do buy the T-post or the wire or the fittings or any of that, you all have a major expense, right? Where does that, ex what do you do with that expense? Taxes, goes on your Schedule F on your taxes, right? And that is available to you because you are engaged in agriculture or engaged as a farmer. The problem with that probably legally is that if I'm a rural landowner and I've got my five acre lot, uh, but I'm not engaged in agriculture whatsoever, when I get a bill for half of that fencing material, uh, the labor, any of that, I don't have a means or mechanism to take that off of my taxes. I don't have a way to expense that. And that's why, that's the legal theory I think that somebody will use to challenge on, is that it's not a fair law to both sides. Some tax credits or incentives could be used in a situation like that, but that's, that's pretty rough. There's not a lot of other businesses that when you move in and start your business, you can charge your neighbor for half of it. Uh, I'd really like that if I could, but uh, that's, that's the law here. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Two ma'ams, ma'am. Oh, okay. So we recently had a landowner come into the USDA office and ask if they they wanted to know if we knew if the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who is their neighbor, would right. be willing to go in on a fence line uh, because of their livestock operation. And so we passed that question along, but I have not yet heard any okay. answer. But do you know? Yeah, I do know. All right, so here, here's the question. Uh, my neighbors, are they required to build or maintain half the fence? The law in Kentucky is absolutely yes. You flip on back a little bit, and if your neighbor is actually a railroad, they've got a couple other special things. But the law is, if neighbor, then pay fence. Her question was, Army Corps. And as an attorney, when I hear Army Corps, you just grind to a halt because that's how everything with the Army Corps is. Uh, you can't call the Army Corps and not be on the phone for four hours why, on hold while they bounce you from department to department. I think for fun, uh, but they're, 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 are they legally responsible? Yes. Getting them to pony up funds and actually do it is much tougher. Same sometimes with school boards, utility companies, uh, county, uh, roadworks and waterways, projects, any governmental entity, because it's not a budgeted item. Sometimes it takes them a very long time, but if your neighbors with a school are neighbors with the extension office, it doesn't matter. They're the neighbor. They're responsible for half uh, under the law. The process to go do that, and I'm telling you what the law says, it's very clear. The actual mechanical process to go claw to try to get a check is very, very tough in a situation like that, but that's a great question. So we've got the... And, and on that same vein, perimeter means perimeter. So we're talking about deeds a minute ago, the large flat rock at the creek up to the very large tree, which may or may not exist. So Clint, you're telling me I gotta pay for the four sides. Let's just assume we're a square. So Clint on one side has Jackson as a, as a, a neighbor on say the right. And then in the back, Chris is my neighbor. And on the left-hand side, Jeremy's a neighbor, right? So how many different landowners do we have there? Huh? Four. Oh, yeah, I'm one. Okay, yes, four. Uh, so there are four landowners that we need to deal with. Well, there's actually three from my perspective, uh, left, right, and back of the farm. Who's responsible for what? Yes, sir. Where's the front? This has always killed me as a... It's always the road with the front. The, the, the front is the road. So what, on my deed, where do I own? And this is a very tricky question in Kentucky. Now on the phone, on the side with uh, Jackson, it's, let's say it's 1,000 feet or 10,000 feet. It doesn't matter. My responsibility, as, as I'm looking at, at uh, Mr. Jackson, and he's looking at me, 
who, whose responsibility is what? And this is found in 042. I, yes, sir, Mr. McCoy, I'm on my property. My half is we find the 50% mark, and it's our fence to the right. So that makes very good sense for what the back side or other side neighbor, correct? So if, if uh, is it Dr. Jackson now? Uh, if, if Dr. Jackson and I share 10,000 feet worth of fence, I'm responsible for my 5,000 feet. He is responsible for his 5,000 feet. That is a very different concept than half, isn't it? Because Dr. Jackson's 5,000 feet is going to be nice, smooth, 10 feet of topsoil. Mine's going to be mountain ranges and rivers and lakes and lagoons and swampland. That's just how they picked a random, arbitrary way to divide the fence, but that is my responsibility. Same as in the back and the side. What about the front of the farm, which was your question, and Mr. McCoy's farm is across the road. Let's assume in scenario number one that it is a county road. No. The Mr. McCoy is my neighbor. That's how your deeds work. Because I know every one of you have been reading your deeds, right? If you can't sleep, get a deed out. It'll help. Mr. McCoy's property, generally speaking, goes to the middle of the road. And my property goes to the middle of the road. And what the county has there, their ownership right, is an easement. So there's an eased or a right-of-way, depending on what your deed's going to reflect on that. But the easement typically is for a term of feet. Usually it is for a two-lane road and then, then starts going from there. So we've got a 10-foot on me, 10-foot on him, 20-foot wide road. Then we start adding ditches or something like that. But my actual property goes to the middle of the road, and so does Mr. McCoy's. Well, who's responsible for the fence there? Can't have one there. It's really be really tough to drive around fence posts down in the middle of a, of a of the highway or the road. So the default setting there is the entirety of your front is yours to fence in, and then the entirety of Mr. McCoy's, even though we are property owners that are abutting each other on the deeds, the practicality removes that. I would challenge you though, reading your deeds, and that sometimes if in the front. If it is not a county road, if it is a state road, or, well, they'd all be state roads here, right? Because we don't have the interstate doesn't touch. Uh, then you have uh, the possibility that the state may be the actual owner of the road. And then the, in that situation, the state is your owner. And the state would be required to fund 50% of that fence. Since I've been giving these talks less 10 or 15 years, the state has gotten wise to that. And when they come in with a road now, you're probably signing a document that waives their right to do so. But there's still some old ones that are out there, so check it. You might, you might luck out on some fence. Yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Ooh, you want to tuck that fence back in. <laughs> Perfect. Does everybody understand the question? And it doesn't have to be exactly for that. What if, you know, Grandpa, who didn't like mowing fence, <laughs> left that real rough uh, division line between, uh, between you and I? Say... So this, it, this is even better, because some of the worst fence line disputes I've ever been around have been cousins fighting each other, fam, former family members. So let's say it was both of our granddads, right? Genetically, neither one of us are going to maintain that fence. <laughs> you know it. I know it. It's fine. I got the looks in the family, obviously. Uh, you got the brains. Uh, that's how we've split it up. So you're on your side, and I'm on mine. And he decides to tuck his fence in, maybe 10 feet for ease of construction maintenance, or maybe you tuck in 300 feet because you want that natural buffer for something else. You want to mow hay, uh, you want to do anything else, right? Now, Clint, 
decides to sell his farm, and new owner comes in, new owner wants to have cattle, guess what you're going to be doing? Building fence on the line. So you can, and again, that's why the, the law only contemplates an, a perimeter fence. So if you build anywhere other than the line, you get to have more opportunities to brace posts and sink them in there and stuff like that. So the fence needs to go on the line if you're going to build a perimeter fence. Mm-hmm. Yes. Will it keep the cattle in? <laughs> Probably not. No. But what if you do, what if part of your, how many people in here do have a property that the boundary line with your neighbor is a stream, intermittent or not, or a, a creek, or possibly a river? So on your deeds, it's going to describe where that is. Sometimes it's the middle. Sometimes it is one bank to the other. Sometimes it's a bank minus five feet. But that's when the deed was created 150 years ago or something like that. So in, in Logan County, the deeds would probably be about 150, 175 years old, uh, something like that. Streams can and do move over time. So you need to figure out where the middle of that is. And if it's not sufficient to build fence in, then you, you need to work out an agreement with your neighbor about, hey, I'm going to fence in my side if you fence in yours. But you need to work out a, a deal. Same theory applies there as what a uh, peers uh, are logic wise for the front of the farm. Everybody get that? You had a question, ma'am? All right. Okay. Um, so That's you and me right now. So 10,000 feet. We have come to the 5,000 foot mark, the 50% mark. Number one, what are we going to do? Before we do anything else, if we have figured out the dead 50% mark, what are we going to do? No, we're going to mark it. Because if, if, if you've gotten mad enough to have to go figure out the 50% mark, you're going to be coming back to that spot. So if you're going to keep coming back to that spot, we are going to mark it. And we're going to mark it with not a T-post. We're going to mark it with something else that you're not going to find with the tractor tire later. So we've done that. That is in KRS 252, well, I'm sorry, 256, 042. Oh, sub 6. That is the statutory command and how to find that part. Yes. Well, there, that's where it is. You should probably owe him a sausage biscuit. Uh, that, that's pretty common fare. So we've got all this. Now, how many people in here are sitting and listening to this thing and, yeah, that's great. Uh, my neighbor's not doing anything. Right? Now, this, that varies from place to place. Where, uh, where I farm in Scott and Fayette County, so, so Georgetown and Lexington, I do not understand where all these people have moved in from. But we have a lot of rural growth, a lot of farms up there have split off acreage in the front uh, and, and backfilled the back. And so people are moving to the rural parts, but are not seeking to participate in that. They want your view, but they don't want your fence. Oh, they also don't want your traffic or your tractor going up and down the road or the smells, the dust, the noise, anything else. But they're moving out there for a purpose. 042, so let's let's start with that. Th these are instructions for you and the court in case your neighbor cannot maintain the fence or if no fence exists and the neighbor is not real inclined to participate in the fencing issue. My number one rule when it comes to fencing law is you do not sue your neighbor. Absolutely not, don't sue your neighbor. Suing your neighbor is your dead last option. You need to go engage with them and have a talk. How many people in here actually know who their neighbor is? That's a trick question. So you do, right? How do you know, sir? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> I'm going to come back to you. Yes, sir. How do you know? Five oh, crap. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, but, well, no, wait. They might have lived on the whole, the property their entire life. They may not be the owner. You're sure? It's not an LLC, a family partnership. All right. Sir? How did you know? Oh, no, I was talking to the guy in the black shirt in the back. He raised his hand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sure. Okay, sure, fair enough. Right. Be very wary when you're talking to this because you could be talking to the owner, but where I am, it's very common for younger folks to say, we own the farm. Really? Pretty sure it's your dad. Or really? Pretty sure it's your grandma. So the owners of the farm had the obligation to maintain and upkeep the fence. So even though grandson might be running the cattle on it, or it might be rented out to somebody else in a leasor relationship, that person doesn't matter. It's the owner that's supposed to be engaged in this. 042 is the instructions to the court when you cannot find relief. The cattle have gotten out several times or no new fencing exists. So let's go through this. If you cannot have a good conversation with your neighbor, have them over, like what you're talking about. Have them over uh, for some pie and coffee. All right, explain this fence law to them. Is that going to work? Anybody have a neighbor in here that that's not going to work with? Do they drink? Have them over for bourbon. That works. If that doesn't work, have another one. And then just keep going until, <laughs> until none of, none of y'all remember. Uh, and then just tell them the next day, hey, remember you? That's a good thing to do. And Yes, that'll happen. Or uh, flags will migrate. I'm not saying that I've helped a flag migrate at any point during my farming career, but I, I farm a lot around a lot of developments, and flags will sometimes appear right where a combine tire needs to go, and uh, it will move while I'm there. Sometimes it gets put back in the same plot. Uh -oh. Sure. Well, let, well, let's read. Dogs are not livestock. So you've got to keep the livestock in. So this fence is going to be on you and them. So let's read 042, and we'll go through real quick. If you have to sue somebody because their fence is not sufficient, you're tired of fixing it, things aren't going to work, or if no fence exists and you need to motivate them or have that lawsuit that you're talking about, this tells you how to do it. So number one says you're going to file in district court. Number two says... The conditions for suing, one of the two have to be involved in agriculture. Number three, the complaint, the document that you file has to describe the two pieces of property. Uh, the specific reason that either a replacement doesn't work. Now hold on, replacement fence, I can sue for that. If you have to document why a replacement fence is needed, what's that mean? It means the fence is bad, right? How do you prove in court the fence was bad? The cattle have already gotten out once, which means you have already put yourself at a liability exposure event. So you have already had your cattle get out once, or they have. And if we're going to submit this as evidence into court, what do you reckon that that's going to look like? I'm sorry? Pictures. Yes, sir. Pictures, documentation, dates, times, witness statements. Pictures are very powerful. Pictures that I have seen where people send me pictures of hoof prints, that's great. Uh, can you show me where the hoof prints are from? No, I didn't take that. Well, so it could be any hoof print. You need to have some sort of background or some sort of GPS marker when you took that. 
you need to show something, not just a picture of a hoof print. There was a case in Woodford County that drug on for years about pictures of hooves. It was pretty amazing. Uh, number four. The number four is in the instruction to the judge, and this is very, very powerful. So the judge is supposed to determine if the fence is inadequate or if the fence doesn't exist in your situation where you laid the flags out uh, for three months so everybody could look at the flags. So it's pretty clear no fence exists, right? Number four is a two-parter. It is number one, if no fence, then judge says to build fence. It's very cut and dry. There is no wiggle room on a judge here. There is no discretion. The only discretion is whether or not an existing fence is adequate or not. But if there is no fence, they must find to build the fence. Number five, uh, uh, well, uh, there, four has several parts. You can argue about what type of fence is going to be built. Typically, it's woven wire with a strand of barbed wire on top. You can argue over fence post size. Uh, terrain might dictate a little bit of that. Uh, you can talk about piling of materials and vegetation removal. If you need to get a track hoe in or a bulldozer or something like that to clear out to see the fence, the judge can order that. Uh, number um Sub D is very interesting in that it says that the judge can assign 50% of the cost to each individual. Now that's very different than my half versus your half. And I've, you know, my half is easier to build on than yours. Yours is the more expensive fence per foot. The judge in this situation does have a little bit of a safety valve to say the entirety of the fence, we're going to split it 50 50 uh, based on that. Uh, number five, if the, per the person loses their case and the judge says the fence must be built. What are you going to do? No, you are not going to build fence. This is my legal warning to you. If you ever go to court and you get a court order to build fence, you're not going to build it. Ever. Why? They've already lost, but now they get to attack you on everything else. Oh, you, those fence posts, I think you overbuild me for them. Oh, that labor, you overbilled me for it. You bid that thing out and you get it built by somebody else. That way your portion of it is done. They lose another angle to attack you on uh, the rest of the time. You, you're, you're looking to get rid of the headache. Uh, and then number six talks about who's responsible. Number seven says if they don't pay for the fence after the judge has ordered it and you've done the bid process and all of that, you get to slap a lien on their property uh, for then on out. Chris has given me the eye. We did not get over nearly as much. I think I was nervous with all the wires and stuff hanging off my body right now. It looks like I'm being monitored for a heart attack. Uh, if anybody, does anybody have any real quick questions? Or you've got my contact material from Chris on this. This is a lot of uh, materials without getting into hardcore examples. we got five more five minutes. Five more minutes. So take some questions, and I'll switch over to Jeremy's presentation. Yes, sir. Owners. Owners are responsible for this. So here's here's the oh, so are you leasing? I'm not, but I'm looking for Here's the deal on that. So you lease a farm and you lease it from Clint, right? And Clint Clint owns a farm and I'm gonna I'm gonna draft something, right? Because we're gonna have written leases. Any lease in the Commonwealth of Kentucky for more than 365 days requires a writing. Well, we shuck hands on it. Well, that ain't a lease. You, then you only have a one-year deal if it's a handshake. Anything beyond 365 days must require writing in Kentucky. But we're going to have that. Number one, if you're going to have an attorney draft it and I ain't got the cows, guess what I'm going to put in there? You got to build the fence. You got to maintain it. And your argument's going to be my cousin over here isn't maintaining his fence. Let's sue him. Don't be surprised if your landowner, who's the one that has the ability to bring a lawsuit, doesn't want to go sue their neighbor. Because likely they are related. Or they've grown up together for a long time. So that's the deal. Uh, a tenant in this situation has zero legal authority to file any sort of action uh, to, to uh to enforce fencing law there. Is only owner against owner. Yes, sir. Well, that's my experience. Mm-hmm. They 
and now they've not done anything. Really? All right. Is that sufficient perimeter fence in Kentucky? Is it keeping the cows in? If they don't get out, then you're all right. But the problem with that is no judge is ever going to order that thing new. Plus, electric fence only works when you have electric. At least if you're running, what, five strands of high tensile or something like that, and you lose some juice on a few of those strands, it's still a physical deterrent. Uh, against something going out there and leaning on it. But I don't consider, just from my angle or view of this, uh, electric fence to be, in and of itself, especially a single wire, to be proper uh, fence. Only if the cows get out. And again, you have the liability because they're your animals. So we, we come back to this point of my neighbor's 50% is crap. Mine's really good because I maintained it or I put built new on it. Am I going to take the risk of running cattle in that pasture? What do you think? I might not. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I'd have to think about likelihood of escape. I'd have to think about where the cattle might go after that line. So if there's a situation where the, the fence breaks, their bad fence breaks, and they get grazed on for a few days while I get my cattle back on to me, say they come up to you and say, hey man, I've got a bill for $3,000 uh, for damage to my property. And you say, that's great, buddy. Um, you need to go build some fence. You know, that's an internal argument. My problem is if that single strand of, a barbed wire is all that keep your cattle from walking through theirs out to the road. I don't know if I could stomach that amount of liability. Speaking of liability, how many people in here are running without insurance? I know nobody wants to raise their hand. Uh, don't, don't hit any of their cows, number one. Uh, if you're going to hit a cow, uh, make sure it's an insured cow. Uh, it's like a car. And then number two, I wouldn't run cattle period, not, I wouldn't have a single hoof step foot on the farm without running a, a probably a million dollars worth of insurance. How much does that cost? I'm sorry? Just a liability policy on something like that. Mine through Farm Bureau is $422 a year. And that, that's just something that, that's a non-starter. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a single head on the farm without, without running the liability insurance that comes with it. Because regardless of our profit margins in cattle right now are the negative margins, uh, depending on uh, when you're selling, it still is nothing compared to the potential liability that's out there. And think about how that looks in a liability situation. Say that you whack a cow, right? Or somebody hits your cow. And you're the farmer, and you're going to go argue that my neighbor's fence wasn't very good, but there's going to be a jury, right? So we're going to show up. And, and as a farmer, I'm going to look over and I'm going to see Mr. McCoy got drawn for jury duty. I'm going to say, hey, well, the judge is going to see that and say, you know, Mr. McCoy, he's gone. Is anybody else in here farm? And they're going to raise their hands. They're going to be gone. So now all the farmers are eliminated from your jury pool. Who's left? Non-farmers. Or what if they woke up that day of your trial and they got behind you or somebody else hauling a hay baler down the road for three miles at 10 miles an hour. And they're already in a bad mood. But just think about the juries are not going to treat you kindly when you go over there because they're not a cross-section of, of farming society. They're a cross-section of regular society. When you eliminate farmers, there's just a whole lot more of them than there are us that remain anymore. Yes, ma'am, this is probably the last one. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that was that, that gentleman's question a while ago. Unless one of the two parties demand the fence, there's no law that says you got to go build it anyway.
Yes, but and that's because your property is neighbors with the actual state owns that property. You need to figure out who your neighbor is on that. Yes, and that's for the fence in the front, or maybe your your fence touches a roadway, you know, on a side or on a bypass or something like that. But you need to figure out who your actual, in any situation, who your actual neighbor is. And that's why I asked the question, because it, it might be the county, it might be an easement where Mr. McCoy and I are neighbors, but we sh the, the easement is owned by the county. In that situation, the, the county's not going to pay. There are state roads that are state easements and then state ownership. And I don't know, but then our, my other question was, who's the actual owner on that piece of property? Just because somebody has lived on that piece of property their whole life doesn't mean that they're the owner. That thing could be in a family trust or it could be in a, an LLC or something like that that they might have control or ownership of, but the, the title owner of the farm is somebody totally different. That's who you'd have to address if you're addressing letters and seeking to build with somebody else. All right. We're going to have to stop there. Yeah. Let's thank Clint for that wonderful presentation. Thanks.